everybody. Welcome to another episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. It's Francis, and with me I have, again, James Stout. Uh, James, who has come on before uh, to talk about 3D printing weapons in the jungles. Uh, and God, who doesn't who doesn't love uh, some, some niche shit that uh, uh, we can dig up? But uh, we brought James back to talk about a few other things he's got going on. James, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm fantastic. It is Monday. But, yeah, you know, it's... Uh, so, sorry, we can't do hell of a way without talking about the weather. So uh, we got oh, yeah. finally got a little bit of finally got a little bit of rain. It's been real dry, but we finally got a little bit of rain uh, over the weekend. We've so. had nonstop. I live in San Diego, uh, the cloudiest city in America, last month. So as a British person, I I can really rejoice in complaining about the weather. <laughs> like, I also got lawnmower recently, so I feel like I'm really like aging into your podcast demo perfectly. Yeah, you got a you got a lawnmower. Do you have a weed whacker? Do you have do you have shoes that are specifically for working in the yard? I did think about that. I, th- I was like, oh, okay, no, I'm getting my running shoes all uh, all grassy. So like that might. Exactly. Be- so what you do is you go buy new running shoes, and then the old running shoes are now yeah. your your mowing. Shoes. I went to buy I running have- shoes the other day, and the guy tried to give me like the daddiest shoes I've ever seen. And I was <laughs> like, I'm not ready for this, man. <laughs> like- where do you where uh who do you get your running shoes through? Uh, where do you normally go? There's a place in San Diego called Roadrunner Sports where like uh, you can they're like a national online company, but they have their headquarters here and they do like a thirty day refund thing where people can send their shoes back and get them refunded if they don't like them. And you can buy the ones that people sent back for like fifty bucks. Oh nice. Yeah. Mow the lawn and uh, carbon I, shoes. I have uh, I've just leaned into Merrell's being my uh, my go to shoe for everything. Yeah. So I use Merrell because uh, I run I run up on the balls of my feet. I don't do heel strike running. So like Merrell is one of the few companies that makes you know trail runner shoes like that. Yeah, that's an extremely early War on Terror kind of vibe. Is uh, Merrell's for everything? <sighs> and and you know like I because it was those goofy fucking toe toe shoes, right? Yeah. Where like everybody everybody made fun of them as they should have because they were dumb as shit. But like I like I always hated running in the army and then I my my wife's told me about, you know, it's like, oh these these cause she got the shoes for like walking. She got like trail something and she's like, yeah, they're like, you know, uh they're like barefoot running. There's this minimalist. There's really not a whole lot to them. They're just like a little you know, it, it's a it's a very expensive sole that you're just strapping to your to your feet to run. But you know, I'm up on the balls of my feet running and that's, you know, and that's how I'm comfortable. So like, I'm, I'm all in on, on Merrill's and, and running like the complete freak that I am, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But without, without individual toes like that, that would be a step could, too far. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's not, I don't need anything in between my toes. I'm just like, imagining like a uniform compliant, uh, like five finger shoe now, which would be great. Oh, we, there, there used to have, there had to be like, depending on which base you were on, they were banned in a lot of places. Cause like, <laughs> cause people would show up with that shit to, to PT and they're like, well, technically these fall within, uh, AR 670 one because they're this color and they're that and that, <laughs> because like nobody when creating the uniform, uh, you know, the, the guidance for a uniform is like, what if somebody makes the dumbest shoe ever? <laughs> we need to account for that. So it kind of became like a, a a command post, scribble it and shove it into AR six seventy dash one. Just be like, also stop with that shit. Um, I haven't seen those since like two thousand and nine, though. So I don't, no. I don't know. They, they might be due for a comeback. I saw kids wearing Heelys at IKEA the other day. Oh, so amazing! I saw in the grown ass adult wearing them yesterday, actually. Heelys? Yeah, nice. I thought I thought she was falling. Like I went, I went to like, <laughs> like to catch her, and then I was like, I oh, know she's still like halfway down, and she's fucking she's oh still shit, falling. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so James, I, I wanted to bring you on because you've been uh, uh, to a few places. Um, one of them recently was the uh, U.S. Mexican border, but and and I know that like obviously everybody's aware of the ongoing, you know. Um, United States fuckery of anybody who's trying to like, you know, not get murdered in their home country and be like, Hey, remember that? Like, you know, you're poor, you're tired, you're weak of spirit and blah, blah, blah thing. Can we be a part of that? And we're saying absolutely not. We, we, we have no desire for that, but you know, um, something that, that, uh, has been happening, which I don't think a lot of, uh, places are covering is the amount of Afghans that are now trying to come up through the Mexican border, which if you remember insane people in 2005, like that was the biggest worry was that that Afghan jihadis were going to fly to Brazil and somehow walk north 
Um, completely uh, forgetting that there's like not a road because Central America is a jungle. Um, you know, there's not exact, but you know, the, there's like, oh, they're going to come up here and they're going to, you know, come into Texas and 9-11 Texas or something. And look, we found a prayer rug. Yes, it's a, it's a big dog's t-shirt, but they love to pray on these things. <laughs> yeah. It- so, so it was a big, it was a big worry once upon a time. Obviously it was stupid back then, but like nobody really seems to be talking about it uh, now because Afghanistan is old news. So kind of give us a, uh, tell, tell us what you experienced and what you're seeing and kind of the responses that's going on. Yeah, for sure. So like in terms of Afghan specifically, I think it's probably better to set the general scene and then explain how this, this impacts Afghan people. Uh, Title 42 ended on the 11th of May at midnight Eastern, right? So Title 42 uh, was this, it was a 1940s public health law, which allowed Border Patrol to, in times of infectious disease, which we were living in, uh, with still are, I guess, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, they were allowed to not process migrants. So if you imagine that you are coming with your family, right, you cross the border, uh, you're apprehended by Border Patrol, they can just bump you straight back to Mexico. Right. They don't process you. They don't you don't have the right. You do have the right to claim asylum. That's an international and U.S. law gives you that right. But then they're not going to give it to you um, so they can just return you to Mexico. Right. They can also laterally transfer you, which means, let's say we find you're coming across in the El Paso sector. We can move you to San Diego and dump you back in Mexico there, which really fucking leaves you in a very vulnerable position. Right. You have no community, no money. What if we made it worse for you? <laughs> yeah. Right. And then so. People will have seen in that context very high numbers of border apprehensions, right? And if they're going with a lot of corporate media outlets to include more liberal ones, um, you'll see these liberal news outlets quoting this like, crisis at the border, apprehensions are soaring. The reason they're soaring is because the same people are crossing multiple times because they have no other fucking option. They're being dumped in places where they have no community, they have no money. Uh, often the, if they're paying someone to help them cross, that person will, will help them cross multiple times at no extra cost. Um, so they, that's why, yeah, you're seeing increased apprehensions because the same person might be apprehended three, four, five times. Uh, and increasingly what these people are doing is moving into places where the border wall, so the border wall just straight up fucking stops in, in lots of places, including one of the places where I was last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just you just kind of walk around it, huh? Yeah, no, for like I was walking down to take pictures, and Border Patrol came and harassed me in their ATVs. But like it, it, it boggles the mind. But it just twenty five billion dollars a mile. It gets to a pile of rocks, and it stops ten feet beforehand. Uh, and like, and and once again, I don't want to, you know, uh, uh, necessarily toot anybody else's horn. But like, China managed a whole Great Wall, and <laughs> yes, that shit's still around, and you cannot walk around it. Like it's in disrepair in some places, but you can't. You're not yeah, exactly yeah. gonna, you know, hop, skip, and jump over it. Can't be defeated with a Ryobi uh, like cutting disc like this. Right, this you can go to Lowe's so I can Angle get through grinder. the Great Wall of China. <laughs> yeah, you know. so that's driven people into more and more remote areas, which has led to more and more death. Right, like a. Uh, approaching a thousand people died last year crossing our southern border. That's numbers that we know about. That like a lot of those people's bodies are not found and reported by border patrol. They're found and reported by volunteers who go out there and do search and rescue. Right. Um, so it's hard to get a total number. And um, what what we can say for sure is that the most deadly point of your journey is not the Darien Gap. It's not taking the trains. It's not crossing any other jungles. It's not walking through Mexico. It, it's the United States southern border. That's where people die. Um, so thousands, millions of people may be taking this journey over time, but thousands were taking it last week or a few weeks ago now, May 11th, right? For the, a month ago, for the end of Title 42. And among them were many Afghan families. Um, very few of them, some did have the, like the father and the mom and the kids. A lot of them, I just meet the mother and the kids and the father isn't alive or is in prison or uh, is you know, being pursued and is hiding or something similar. Um, so what the, what the Border Patrol did is, bear in mind, you know, we knew for months that Title 42 was ending because the public health emergency was ending around COVID-19, so there was no justification for it anymore. It's worth pointing out that Title 42 has existed under Biden for a lot longer than it existed under Trump, right? Biden's border policy is every bit as cruel and sometimes more cruel than Trump's. Um, we've made a whole series on this on a podcast I will follow, which is called It Could Happen Here, so people can listen to that more if they'd like to hear more about Biden's shit. Um, but 
what they did was they corralled people in the open air, right? So they would detain them crossing the border. Lots of these people don't want to like sneak in, right? They want to present themselves and claim asylum per international and US law. Um, and Border Patrol was holding them out in the open. So in San Diego and San Isidro, which is our border town with Tijuana, um, they were holding people between the two. We have two border walls here, right? They were holding people between them uh, five, six days. They got one bottle of water and one granola bar every day. Um, and then out in Hakumba, if people are familiar, it's not 29 Palms, but like I'm thinking of a, a thing that people might be familiar with that, that, is, that is close to Hakumba. 29 Palms is, is a bit north of us, but it is a bare ass desert. It's not dissimilar, right? Um, I know 29 Palms is the Mojave. It's a bit higher where we were, so we got colder at night. And, and it was still very warm in the day. So like 90s in the day, you know, 30s, 40s at night. And Border Patrol held people there for days with no shelter, right? People built their own shelter out of uh, sticks and creosote plants and, and cacti. Uh, and um, among them were lots of Afghan families, right? So these are people who we've sort of, uh, obviously like lots of the things we said about the war in Afghanistan were lies. Um, but like obviously those lies have had real impact on people's lives and those people who believed us or, you know, who didn't actively oppose the US occupation of Afghanistan, I guess, are now facing the consequences of that. And, and some of them are coming here and asking us to help them. And we've responded by leaving them out in the bare ass desert with one bottle of water a day and a granola bar. And if it wasn't for random strangers, like groups of people who live in Hakumba, Hakumba is a tiny town. I think it's 50, population of 50 or something. Um, those people fed and, and looked after and sheltered and gave water to 1,500 people in the desert. It wasn't Border Patrol. It wasn't DHS with its $175 billion budget. It was a, a group of people who own a hotel out there and, and random people who'd seen it on the internet and showed up and helped. So a lot of these are Afghan families, I just spoke to a family, you know, they were visibly distraught at not only like the... the a very desperate and sad situation they find themselves in but also like well fuck we're here and this is it like you know you're, you're gonna keep us in the desert like almost literally in a cage right like the only way in san isidro that we could get food and water to these people was through the border wall by sticking your hand through um and like there was a little afghan girl actually who was very sweet but you know maybe four or five years old and it just like little it, she, she was like reaching through the bars at a wall to get something and it really for whatever reason different things affect you you know but like seeing a little kid's hand go through like these bars was just so sad um, so let me ask the we, we've had plenty of afghans come through uh you know fly fly in uh be brought in uh through uh, what, what was the program we we're using to bring because i know we resettled some yeah there's but like sivs and uh yeah yeah so are we taught? So are these people down here uh, at the border? People who like were just their SIVs were ignored, or they don't have them. They're, they're just like, look, I for whatever reason it is, I can't. You know, I I don't have. You know, if if you're not aware of Afghanistan, it's a very patri patriarchal uh, kind of s scenario going on. No matter who's in charge, always has been. So if you're a single mom, you're very fucked over there. Uh, and and so I understand the the desire to come uh, to come to here, but where uh, you know why is it that the uh, the only option that these people have is to try to smuggle themselves up through the border? Yeah, I think a lot of people left to third countries, right? Like there was this idea we're going to process people through third countries. They ended up in Pakistan, uh, maybe some went to Tajikistan. I'm sure some went to Iran. Uh, Probably isn't the easiest way to get to the US. Um, no, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, um, so I think a lot of them waited there for a while, and then those third countries were like, "Okay, we've had you, you have a visa here." I've heard of that happening in Pakistan, right? Uh, of people getting castled from by the Pakistani government, saying, "Look, you, you know, are you here? Are you staying here? You, you know, what's your legal status in Pakistan?" Right? So they sort of they wait and wait and wait on the US. I think the US immigration bureaucracy is. It's just a mire. You don't know what's happening with you. I, I'm an immigrant to the United States myself, right? It, it's just a black box. You put in your application, and then one day they say yes or no. Um, and so for a lot of these people, getting an SIV is hard, right? I think you have to have an officer sign it. Um, there are other different visa categories people can get, but they're complicated. And if you didn't happen to have a, a particularly close relationship with an American officer or 
someone you can call. Maybe you've lost touch with them, you know, something like that. Or maybe you weren't directly. Uh, I wrote an article for Red Bull last year about a young woman who she's an excellent cyclist, right? She was a pro cyclist. She was racing her bike in Afghanistan. Um, she didn't directly have anything to do with, with the American military per se, right? She's just doing something which is now considered objectionable, or it was considered objectionable by the Taliban, I guess. Um, but because there was an opening there for her to do that, she did it. She loves it. Like, that's who she is. And, and now her and her family are facing persecution, um, partially because of what, what she did and partially because they're Hazara, right? Like, they're this uh, persecuted minority uh, group. So people like that, it's much harder for them to get a visa, right? Like, and, and the, the asylum categories are also hard. Like, there are certain categories which one has to fall into. Um, and, and, like, I'm a bike racer isn't really one of them. Or, like, they don't like girls doing shit that I do isn't one of them necessarily. Um, so, so it's much harder for those people. Now, what they're supposed to do is make an appointment using an app called CBP1. Uh, that app sucks. It, it's riddled with bugs. And it doesn't do very well at taking pictures of faces of people with darker skin. Um, so I know before, in, in early May, we heard that of the appointments for asylum interviews made using the app, 44% were going to Russian nationals, who represent less than 10% of the migrants in Tijuana. Um, but because they're wealthier and they stay in hotels with Wi-Fi, uh, they're getting all the appointments. So it's... Uh, it, it's a number of things that drive people to come this way, and, and, and the we can't discount just like misinformation, right, or not being able to access information, proper information, and, and simply being desperate and not wanting to be in a desperate situation anymore. And like this lie that we told that like we're here and we care about you, people think well they cared about me, so I'll just go there and they'll care about me. And, and it, that was a lie then, and it did a lie when we lock up little children in the desert too, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's, well, that's it's, it's what we do very well is uh, is pro is promise a whole lot of things, and mm -hmm. I, and I really wish that there was like some way that like we could go to these people and it's like, look, I need you to understand, it's not going to go the way that you think it is, and like and like and, and and that sucks because like we did this, you know, for anybody who's coming here and is just like, I want to get to a better life in America. 95% of those, I'm going to say, is directly because of some shit that America did in that country to those people. Um, you know, and I say 95% because I am leaving a little window open for maybe there's like a Brazilian guy who just really wants to come up through the, the border. But like, for the most part, it's fucked because of what we did. And then, you know, I just been like, you know, you know, the way we fucked at your country. Do you really think on an individual level we give a shit like we we don't. And like it, it sucks to say that out loud because, you know, I have been imbued with all of the uh, American propaganda of nation of immigrants and so welcoming. And, you know, ever you know, you go to New York and you hear a 100 different languages and, and all that is great, but then, you know, that gets juxtaposed upon, like, hey, we're, random states are going to send their National Guardsmen down to defend the border, and, like, we've done episodes on the National Guardsmen who go down there as well. What are they doing? They're not getting paid. They're, like, not getting federal funds, so they're not getting, like, retirement, they're not getting school, they're not getting BAH stuff. Uh, they don't really have any, uh, you know, job there, and they're just drinking themselves to death. Uh, in in a lot of in a lot of ways, so like on our side of the border, we are con we are also just completely shooting ourselves in the dick, uh, and then on the other side of the border, we're just shooting them in the dick uh, because that's you know specifically what America does very well. So it is very like it's it's just very it's heartbreaking, you know. Like I didn't even see it just listening to you, looking at the pictures that you sent through, man. Like I got a I got a daughter, and like as somebody who like can understand a desperate situation. You know, I went to Iraq, I went to Afghanistan. I saw how people had to live there, you know, even in the quote best of times. And, uh, it's not great. It's, it's not great. And it's really, it's just really shitty. What, what, uh, America has decided that it can do and how really nobody else gives a shit, you know, like it, there, the, obviously there are, there's you, there's volunteers down there. There's people who are trying to do something, but it's not like this big, Hey, you know, these people helped us or at the very least, Hey, for the last 20 years, 
Um, we have put like all the a generation of Afghan men through a meat grinder. Maybe we could be nice to the people who are showing up. I don't know. Like you know what? If let's if if you if if we have to keep racism in it somehow, fine. If you're a woman or a kid, you can come in, no questions asked. The the guys got to go through. I don't know. They got to get a background check or something. I've always been I've always been a person that believes immigration should take ten minutes. Like, how long does it really take for you to say, "I renounce uh, my former countries"? Here's your new social security number. Have a good time. Yeah, all right. yeah it's not. Uh, we've like, uh, to my understanding, one person who was on a watch list, one Afghan, was apprehended in, in El Centro. Like, cool, great. Like uh, that person was on a watch list. They found that person's name. You know, like, and uh, these people are going to be extensively vetted as they spend the next. Uh, I've heard of court dates for asylum hearings in 2027. So for the next four years, they're waiting, if, if they're fortunate enough to be allowed to wait in the United States, often without the right to work. Uh, so that that's four years where these guys, if they want to pay their bills, if they want to pay the up to $12,000 it can cost to have a lawyer to represent them in that hearing, they're going to have to save that by working under the table. Like They, ain't- they, want, a little bit, they want a little bit more than uh, a granola bar and a bottle of water. Yeah, exactly. I, do, I should say that like, among the like it's not the people of the united states per se i mean some people are pieces of the shit they are everywhere but like uh, i'm always genuinely impressed by the people who turn up at the border like people from every diaspora there were afghan people afghan people who are now living in the united states afghan american people um who showed up at the border and helped and like the other big issue that people who speak pashto or dari are facing at the border specifically is just fuck all information for them right they don't know what's going on and, and if you don't speak English, Spanish, then it's very like I, I was translating for a lot of African migrants and um, because of uh, some language capabilities I have, mostly French, actually, I was mostly speaking French. Uh, and, and they didn't know what was happening because, you know, they're only getting announcements in English and Spanish, maybe Spanish. Mm-hmm. And so these Afghan folks, what they don't know what's going on beyond like a man has put me in this place in the desert and I can't leave and he has a gun like Right. Uh, so my, my situation here in Mexico has not really improved uh, <laughs> over the situation I had in Afghanistan. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's another. It's a different dude. The different gun. Maybe the same gun because a lot of those ended up in Afghanistan. But uh, yeah, it certainly <laughs> did, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> At least no one's got their like uh, ACOG on backwards or whatever that that one funny guy had. Um, but yeah, it, it's a, it's a very sad situation, and it, it is impressive to see people turning up to help. But like, it shouldn't be on first generation migrants right like uh, of every single diaspora like it, it is like the nation of migrant thing is is obviously like it's a lie that's told to cover up the fact that we uh, perpetuated a genocide against indigenous people and stole their land but um like it it is nice to see all these people who are migrants to america showing up and be like hey we're here to fucking welcome you even if joe biden is is screwing you over monumentally like, right like, that's hot one. Well, we're going to do the best that we can yeah. uh, in a bad situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it was, it's cool when like, I can see like anarchist black block kids and also like church ladies with high heels and perms uh, just standing right next to each other. So people needed to charge their phones. The biggest demand was for phone charging to use that stupid app and, and to communicate with your family. Right. And because they're locked in the desert in between two walls, they can't charge them. So um, I bought this giant ass power brick that I happen to have. Other people bought, uh, like I have a solar generator is what it's called. Other people bought stuff like that. And people devised a system whereby they'd take a phone, put painter's tape on it, write the name of, of the phone owner, and then give them a similar piece of paper's tape with their name written on it. They put that on their arm and then they could come and get the phone back. And it was cool to see like, yeah, like, you know, someone with red and black painted nails and, and you know, but like an ACAB battle jacket or whatever. And, uh, a, a, and a lady who goes to the Baptist church, uh, just like seamlessly working together to help people. Like that is always the the best part of a bad situation. But um, it, we, you know, we, we have fucking F 35s. We, we should be able to give people a little bit more than a granola bar. Well, have you seen our F 35? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Maybe we could give them an F 35. And uh, if you can you land go. that thing, then you're allowed to it's live like the- in America. Yeah, you remember when Pepsi gave was giving away a jet for uh, 7 million Pepsi points? Yep. Guess what? We're going to do that for the migrants now. Yeah. All right, so, so James, what else, uh, what else do you have going on? Uh, so the other thing, a big thing I've got going on, like kind of long-term wise, is I'm writing a book um, for AK Press about anarchists at war. So I'll be, be traveling about uh, to different places where anarchists are doing wars at the moment, um, uh, probably to include Syria 
uh, or not North and East Syria, I should say, um, to include, uh, you know, maybe back to Myanmar, uh, um, other places. Uh, I'd like to go a couple of places in Africa I'm interested in going. Um, depends how far we can stretch that book advance. And then obviously I'll look at historical examples in Spain as well. So I'm interested in talking about how if war is a reality of human interaction, right? It's not going anywhere. And as people who want to build networks outside of the state to care and support for one another, how do we meet that without abandoning our core principles? And it's kind of ignored in a lot of anarchist theory. I don't think anyone's reading a lot of anarchist theory, which is fine. Uh, so I want to look at how, how do people who subscribe to this worldview meet with warfare? Like, what, what does that look like? Yeah. So what, I mean, what is it about anarchism that, I mean, does it necessarily push back against warfare? Like, I know, I know an anarchist is not going to be the one who says, Hey, look at those resources over there. We should go shoot them and take them. Uh, cause that's like very, so it, it, it feels like anarchism has more of a defensive posture than an offensive posture. Yeah. And community defense is well established in anarchism, right? The idea that communities should be able to autonomously defend themselves from attack. Uh, from people who would seek to govern them, right? Impose authority upon them. Uh, but it, yeah, anarchism, as you say, shouldn't seek out war. It certainly shouldn't. I mean, war is often a conflict between two states. So if we're looking to build a society without a state, then we shouldn't be having these interstate conflicts or, or these res resource conflicts. But in order to get to a place where we can live without authority, sometimes we have to travel through that. And sometimes through no fault of our own, uh, as we're seeing in Ukraine, we're seeing in North and East Syria, right? Like the the conflict with uh, the so-called Islamic State in North and East Syria opened up an opening for those people to to create a more autonomous and more equal state, right? And the same, a little bit less so in, in for instance, in Chiapas. And I know it's not like classical anarchism, but if we look at what happened there in 1994, uh, it, it was through force of arms that people were able to open up a little, a little space that they could a little grow and expand this crack and, and form their more equal, more caring society within that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was... Um, yeah, so I'm interested in, like, if, if we look at anarchism very simply as ways to care for one another without controlling one another, right? Like, these means of supporting your community without creating the state, without creating authority, then how does that meet with, I think, very often... If, if you take a classical perspective on warfare, right, we're told that what we need is discipline and what we need is authority. Probably these are things that, that you might be familiar with um, from your time in the US Army, right? Yeah, like a, a, a man whose job is shouting is going to tell you that your boots are wrong or your hair is wrong, your fucking sleeves are rolled the wrong way. Uh, and that is integral somehow to war fighting. Um, and, and it, so I, it, it kind of is for some people. And, and that's why, like, I, uh, I will always kind of defend stuff like that because I do understand the purpose of it. I do understand the purpose of, you know, it, you're supposed to all look the same because you move the same because you work together the same. Um, but the, what that is, is like when, when you've got a military unit, like I went to basic training. It's like, hey, here's you and here's 59 guys. Like you've never met them. You don't know shit about them. You're going to learn about them. You're going to make friends. You're going to make enemies and things like that. But, you know, it, it, and, and in some ways, it, you, you bond over shared hatred over the drill sergeant. But I imagine with, like, an anarchist group, you've already got a lot of, like, not necessarily, like, here's, here's our org chart. Here's who's on top and who's not on top. But, like, kind of a, uh, we understand who has strengths and who has weaknesses. And, like, leadership and somebody being a leader isn't necessarily antithetical to anarchism in itself. You've got to have somebody who can say, yes, we should go, we can make the decisions. We go this way, we go that way, we can do these things. You know, I'm sure every anarchist group has somebody like that. But then it still is, you know, kind of a uh, an expression of, yes, that's a good idea. Do we all agree with that kind yes. of situation? Yeah, like a modified consensus as opposed to just a simple authority is generally so like if you also like the wars that one is fighting as an anarchist uh, are different to the wars that one is fighting as a soldier right like uh there, there's when you're in the army you're part of a big organization and they have to be able to swap you for anyone else who who has your mos and your rank right and you can be interchangeable and you have to go and do things which you don't necessarily 
uh, like it, it, you're not directly defending your community, right? When when you were in Afghanistan or Iraq, like not not at all. <laughs> so that, that's a little different to someone in Ukraine right now, right? Like there's a pretty fucking clear, like right. like no one needs to shout at that guy to get him to go to the front line. Like he 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 understands what's at stake. Um, so like the way that these units tend to operate, in my experience, like if I look at the um uh, the Kareni Gen Z army, like, they're not explicitly anarchist. Uh, they're explicitly Zoomers. Uh, which is fascinating to me, but they, uh, when they were telling me how they organized their unit, it was using that modified consensus, right? Sitting down and being like, hey, we're going to attack this position. Uh, and someone being like, hey, well, I have some experience in this, so I think we should do this way. And everyone else being like, oh, well, I don't know, fuck all about it, so I'm, I support you. Or someone being like, hey, I can fly the drone, and I can do this, or I have experience doing this, so I can do that. And people tend to listen to people who, who have insight, right? No, no one wants to fucking die because uh you know they didn't listen or they, they advanced their uninformed perspective so according to them at least they would discuss and then adopt a consensus position and then go with it and, and then maybe sure but like but on the ground though yeah. you still have to have some kind of like someone calling the shots and right or somebody who can at least say or they, they can give like oh this you know our plan went went to shit over here but we can move over there everybody move over there you know, you have to have, and, and, and again, I'm not like, I'm never going to be one to bash anarchists. I've never had a bad, um, a bad experience with anarchists before. Um, and, and I'm sure like, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading this cause this is, this is genuinely, genuinely curious as to how you, you know, have a, uh, a, a small fighting group like this. That's really more like, because they're like, you're not really a state actor, right? Because you're anarchist, you're not you're not a uh, you're not part of a state. So, like, do you fall into that like insurgent you know category at that point? Yeah, like a militia. Sometimes they're described as, or like yeah, sure. regular units. I think they they generally have someone who'll call the shots on each different sort of thing, depending on who's best suited at that. Like, so I, I don't think there's I don't think people. Someone's like, hey, go over there, and someone's like, no, my autonomy says I'm going to go over here and getting fucking shot, right? Like, right. Uh, yeah, I I admit it's it's kind of a like, look, we've uh we've we've got a guy who's done this like ten times before. Mm-hmm. Listen to what that guy says. Yeah, uh, and and me as a smart anarchist, be like, fuck yeah, I've never done this, so I'm going right. to listen to what the guy who's done it ten times. Yeah, says. as opposed to this is Giles and he went to Sandhurst, so you're going to do what he said. Right. Uh, <laughs> like, um, so like it, it's it's a, I, but then I'm interested to spend more time with these people in situations where shit isn't going according to plan and uh, and see how that goes down. Right. Okay, that's why you can't write these books by just going on the internet. Like you have to travel places and go places and and meet with people. So. Right, you have to have to go get shot at yourself. Yeah, apparently. it's part of the fun of the job. It's why next to me is a collection of uh, plate carriers and helmets. See, I got out of the army <laughs> to stop doing that shit. Yeah, no, it did. Where do you where do you get your plates from? Uh, so I got some from Safari Land of all places. Who I I, <laughs> I don't know what they very kindly sent me some really nice uh, three plus special threat plates. I've since become like. Uh, maybe I should get some level four plates because I'm worried about the uh, the 54 hour rounds that Russian troops use. The um, yeah. like the most in Nagant and Dragunov and all that stuff. Uh, because the, the, those are not those are zipping straight through uh, some plates. So um, I think I need to get some better ones. Or maybe some do you put a do you do you have a plate back or two or are they already built Kevlar so like? What I have is what's called an here. I think it's called MBAV. Um, I think it was a uh, modular body armor vest, which was like a U.S. Uh, army spec thing that they did for some units. Um, so yes, it has the plate to stand alone, but then you can also use the. Pl- there's a slightly wider soft armor backer that you can also use on its own if you want to wear it under a jacket or something like that. Gotcha. Yeah, we had um, my my plate carrier doesn't have any like kind of padding, but the ones that they gave us when we went overseas is like, look, even without the body armor, these things are rated to like you know stop a nine mil at least. Yeah, yeah, the pistol, so, and then so they, they weigh a ton, and you sweat everything. Yeah, so they told yeah, and then you put the plates in. I my my first one, my first deployment in two thousand four. There, uh, it was the old like I was in desert camo uniform. They gave us woodland camo body armor uh, to really make us stand out in the desert. You know the. Uh, there that motherfucker is uh <laughs> yeah, he armor, like a but, bush running along yeah. right and then but it was fine it was just like you know you got the carrier you've got the plates you're fine you move on and then when i deployed in uh in 2009 they're just like oh we added a whole bunch of bullshit to this and they're like they put like the uh the delt 
things on. They put the groin protector on. They put side plates in and everything. And it's like, this is unwieldy. Yeah. And I, like, th- there's a certain point where it's just like, um, sure, I'm very protected, but also I'm basically a turtle. I can't do anything. I'm just <laughs> yeah. kind of flopping around on my back here because everything weighs, you know, 75 pounds and I'm losing all of my salt in an hour by sweating it out. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the uh, the dick flap. I've been, we can say that on the podcast. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think if, if you cover civil unrest in the United States and you're a journalist or just a person who participates, uh, the cops do love to shoot less lethals at your groin. Uh, and having had a couple of very close calls, I just took a ricochet to the painful parts of my body um, a couple of years ago. Um, so I've been I've been doing the Kevlar dick flap, but yeah, it's not it's not much fun running in that thing. <laughs> like it, no, it it's, right it's real floppy. Yeah. yeah, it's I never really understood because like nobody explained it to me. They're just like, hey, this this gets attached to the front. It's the dick flap, and all I remember is being very irritated trying to pee with that thing. Like if you if a dick flap has been um, put out and somebody has worn it, there's piss on it. At some point in time, a soldier has pissed on it, whether accidentally or on purpose. I cannot tell you, but it is absolutely 100% happened. Because, like, trying to... Getting into a porta potty in full battle rattle and then trying to, like, find your dick and then pee is the most... Is, and then it's 130 degrees in there and it smells like shit. Like, th- there's a lot of, like, you know, uh, stressful situations I've been in, but that was one of the more stressful ones of, like, <laughs> trying to undo a fly over, like, lifting the dick flap and then going over the body armor and then under it. And, uh, it's a whole thing. Yeah, I could see that being quite a conundrum. Yeah, don't, uh, don't, don't recommend it. But also... Don't want to get shot in the dick. So, yeah, you, know, you wear the you wear the dick flap properly. California tried to ban body armor. They they luckily walked that back. Uh, but I know New York has banned. I think they only brand like Kevlar, like soft armor. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty dark situation when like folks are contacting me, being like, "Hey, my kid's in I don't know American grades. I don't have children, but uh, fifth grade or whatever." And they're trying to ban body armor, and I'm looking to buy like a rifle plate that they can put in their backpack. Mm. And like that's where we're fucking at. Uh, yeah, it's great. That's, that's a big reason why we homeschool. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why you homeschool, but another one is uh, don't don't like tornado drills were were bad enough for me when I was a kid. I wouldn't be like, hey, daughter of mine, why don't you? Uh, like, she's she's already afraid of guns. Like, I haven't I haven't managed to uh, to get that one out of her yet. Um, we'll get there we'll, eventually. Yeah, you could uh, do what my dad did and just take her out at a young age with a. Uh... 12 bore shotgun and have that like recoil violently into her shoulder and that probably isn't the best technique no um i have a i have a friend uh, a fellow homeschooling dad uh who's very he he owns a farm and he's very outdoorsy and he's teaching his his oldest i think is like six yeah uh and he teaches them he's he's like if you guys want to come out and do shoot shooting stuff we do bb guns so yeah you know, that's the way like, oh, well that's that's fun. You know, you go out and do BB guns all day long. Um, they're not loud. They're not, you know, they're, they're dangerous enough to make you be like, all right, we have to pay attention. We have to be very careful. But also, if you ND up into the air, it's not that big of a deal. Right. Yeah, yeah. I grew up with a little pellet gun. I shot tons of rabbits when I was a kid. And uh, you learn a healthy respect for how dangerous those things are without, yeah, being scared of a big bang and boom. Uh, maybe that could get us somewhere. Like, I, I do think, like, maybe guns are going to be around for the fucking... Even if they banned all the sale of guns now, there'd be hundreds of them forever. Like learning, teaching kids how to safely handle them might mm-hmm. take some of the mystique away. Yeah, and that's like I, you know, I I own I own multiple guns. Uh, I like to shoot. Um, a big part of it is because my brain is broken, and I feel the only way that I'm safe is if I have a gun. Like le- like not even on me. Like they're in a safe. Like they're not like they're not like oh I've got to you know keep one behind the couch or anything. But. Uh, you know, it's still, it makes me feel good to know that, like, if necessary, I can, you know, violently defend myself. But uh, also, you know, I, the, with with my kid, it's just very like, look, whatever, however you feel comfortable. I'm more than happy to take you out in the back. We can shoot BBs, you know, all day long. It, it'll be fine. Um, but if this is never a thing that you want anything to do with, that's okay. Um, which was never, it, there was never an option that I had growing up. Like, my dad, my dad was in the army, but he's just like, no, guns are dumb. Uh, don't want him in the house. Uh, don't don't necessarily want you to go shooting. But then you know, seventeen, I want to join the army. Oh yeah, go ahead. Here you go. We'll sign <laughs> off. Sign off for you to join the join the military early. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. I know, it's it's very interesting. Like I, I'm fascinated by American perspective on guns, and as someone who's also 
you know, uh, invested in decreasing the power of, of violence that the state has, right? Like it, it's, a, it, it's, that comes with the us all sort of taking some of that responsibility onto ourselves, right? And none of the groups I'm writing about, none of the people I'm traveling are, are not, do not own guns. Uh, so it's interesting to me to look at like how anarchists meet with that too, right? Like it's, cause it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a big responsibility, but like we're, it's a big responsibility to trust that to the state too, right? Like I saw a lot of men with guns scaring a lot of little children last week and last month now. And like. Also, bizarrely, I sent an SRT with, uh, they're not paintball guns. What are they called? Pepper balls. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, which I, I don't understand. Like, like full battle rattle, like full plate carriers. Some of them had the helmets on, some of them didn't, but like uh, with pepper ball guns. And I, I don't quite know what the threat model is there, where you've got rifle there's, plates. <laughs> and a pepper there's some ball. weird. There's some weird kits. One one thing that's uh, stuck in my brain from the various protests over the last you know ten years was this big guy with a big beard. He had the black, uh, uh, you know, black shirt with a uh, black tactical vest and body armor and everything. Uh, he had uh, a helmet, and the helmet had like a view, like a little screen that could fold down on it. Um, and he was holding a two hundred dollar Rough Rider revolver, um, <laughs> like the twenty two one. Yeah, aggressively uh, pointing it like this uh, huge dude, and like this little. Like a twenty, like if you haven't looked at the Rough Rider, first off, there's two things that are great about it. One is that it's you know the perfect like you know starter gun if you just want to like oh I want to plink things with the twenty two. But secondly, they have a a, a version that has a sixteen inch barrel. They have a fucking Joker gun <laughs> from from the first Batman. Yeah. Uh. So so yeah, there's a lot of like you know and uh another one is I remember a story of two guys in full battle uniform you know the full whatever uh body armor and everything walking around with rifles and everybody was making fun of them because you know it's like oh you don't have any um sights on your rifle you know to but then it turns out that they were just airsoft guns anyway so it's like i don't even like because i i i know that a lot of these a lot of these people are very dangerous i know that and i know it's very easy to get a hold of an ar-15 I fucking had one mailed to me. So like, I get it. It's, it's, it's not great. Um, and it's not great that crazy people can get a hold of these guns, but also like, if you're going to show up to a gunfight and not bring a gun, I'm very confused by your, by, by what you thought was going on here. Like you can get an AR 15 for 500 bucks. If you find one on sale, I don't understand why you're, why you can't just spring for that with, uh, with all of this stuff other than probably a felony. I'm sure there yeah, might be, yeah, there, yeah. Might, there might be gun laws that are actually working correctly to keep that person. From <laughs> That's why Alan Swinney turned up in Portland with a, uh, black powder revolver because <laughs> a felony <laughs> technically uh, not illegal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, um, I know that like, it's so people make too much of this, especially like shit libs on, on twitter.com, like the whole, like your gun is your penis thing. But there is something to be said about guns as a sort of accessory for performative masculinity. And it, it's not a smart move. If you turn up yeah, to confront the state with a BB gun, like <laughs> cause you, it looks like a fucking gun. Like, it, yeah, we had, they're a, not going to, they're not going to ask questions, man. They, they'll, they'll shoot you down for, uh, holding a, a wallet or a, a bottle of soda wrong. So like, yeah, no, I saw a kid pull, a, a one uh, the kid was a member of a sort of anti Black Lives Matter group. Produce a gun from sort of middle pocket of a hoodie, and uh, appointed at someone, and uh, it turned out to be an airsoft gun. I, I've been around a lot of guns. I've been robbed at gunpoint. Like I know what a pistol looks like up close, and uh, I have pistols too. But I was straight behind a car. Like I wasn't messing around. You know, it's if I was a cop, yeah, I'm sure cop brain you'd have you'd have shot that kid maybe not. yeah i mean normal just any brain is just like oh somebody pulled a gun on me yes um yeah yeah I, that that's not necessarily cop gun that's just nor that's yeah, you know, yeah. If, it's a it's reasonable a response flight. if someone's right. exercising lethal force so yeah that is a bizarre choice a series of choices that leads you to that to that position yeah you shouldn't have become a cop in the first place <laughs> Well, James, thank you so much for coming on. Tell people where they can find you. Yeah, of course. So if people want to listen to the border stuff, um, I work for a podcast called It Could Happen Here. Uh, you can find it on any place where you get podcasts for free. Or if you want to spend your money and listen to it without adverts, you can do that on Apple Podcasts. Um, specifically, my podcast about the border were under the title of Title 42. Um, and I think they were uh, on the... You can either listen to them. There are four different 
episodes, each about 30 to 50 minutes. Uh, you can listen to them one after the other, or you can listen to them all combined together in, in one big episode, uh, just, just by searching Title 42. It could happen here. You'll find it anywhere. Um, they can find me on Twitter at my name is James Stout. Uh, it's about the only thing I do social media wise. And if they want to buy my book, they can wait until 2024 and it will be available where good books are sold or in libraries where you can get good books for free. I have another you, book, which you can also get free at your library. Uh, it's about, I was going to say, you also, you also have a Patreon, don't you? I do. Yeah. Fuck. I'm bad at that. Support, yes. No, no. Support, support James going, because J- James is going to all these places and getting shot at to, uh, to, to inform you on things that are not being informed otherwise. So yeah. kick him a couple bucks. I'd like to avoid the getting shot at this. It, it does seem, uh, I know Syria is interesting right now. Maybe, uh, maybe I can uh, like do a world tour of getting shot at by Russians. Um, so um, one day, James, you will be shot at on every continent. We'll go down. We'll go down to to the Antarctica. We'll give a penguin a gun. We'll we'll figure it out. <laughs> I'm doing a new continent. I'm going to a Bikini Atoll. Maybe I can do a world tour of uh, places America has fucked up. Uh, maybe yeah, if, if someone tries to nuke me, that might be my last huzz- hurrah. But, yeah, yeah. It's James Stout well, on Patreon. Just my name. Try and keep it easy for people. Yeah, it'd be the first time that uh, we can say James came back with glowing reviews. <laughs> yeah, and three eyes. Yeah. James, thank you so much. Everybody, thank you for listening. Of course, you can find more of our stuff on patreon.com slash hell of a way to die. Uh, stickers, t- you know, uh, patches, pins, stuff like that at hell of a way to die dot com. Uh, but also, we appreciate anything. If you guys got a comment, you want a suggestion uh you know if you've got something to say send it on uh one way or another you can put it in a cannon and you know shoot it towards st louis somewhere and hopefully uh we won't take that as an act of war um but and then your message will get to me so it'll all work out but everybody thank you so much and uh we'll talk to you next week <laughs>